Today's session is about grammar and I'm going to start today by telling you the beginning and end of a story about a student in a grammar class. So sit back, relax, um, close your eyes if you'd like. The beginning of the story is this. You walk into a classroom, you move a couple of chairs, put your bag down, pick out your pencil case, then sit down in your usual chair in the middle of the classroom, a few rows back. You hear the talking around you start to slop, stop slowly, then it's quiet. You look up. You see your teacher trying to come in through the door, then she manages to make it in. Why is she finding it so hard? She has her arms out, she's struggling to find her way, and you look at her face and see that her eyes are covered with a scarf she has tied round her head. She bumps into a chair. You laugh. She gets close to the chair, then touches it with her hands, feeling it, and trying to work out what it is. Is this a table? She asks. You, you laugh again. No, it isn't, your teacher says. Is it, is it a chair? She says, feeling it. Yes. Yes, it is. This is the first time you've ever heard the grammar. You, you understand what it means, but it's hard for you still to work out exactly which words your teachers used. OK, let's skip forwards in the class by 30 minutes to the end of a story. And at this point, a pretty amazing transformation has happened. You're still in the classroom. It still looks the same. Your teacher walks over to you now and, scar and ties a scarf round your head, covering your eyes. One of your classmates puts something into your hands. You open your eyes under the scarf and try to look out the bottom of it to see what there is there. But the scarf's on too tight. You can't see anything. So you reach out for the object, touch it, then reach out for the words. Is it a pencil? You ask. You hear back from your friend. Yes, she says. Yes, it is. Today's webinar is about the middle of this story. It's about the amazing transformation that we hope happens in the middle of grammar lessons. It's the stage where students move from being a, unable to use grammar to being able to do a lot of powerful things. They can remember the grammar without being prompted. They can manipulate it, for example, changing is it a pencil to is it a pen. Um, they can write and they can spell the grammar. They can pronounce it in a way that other students understand. And we hope that students are able to do the, all of these things quickly and automatically. So what do I hope to achieve in this session? Well, firstly, we're going to zoom in on, gram on the grammar practice stage of um, yeah, grammar lessons or grammar teaching sequences. I wanted to talk about this part of the lesson in particular because I remember when I first started lesson planning that I'd think a lot about how to introduce new grammar at the very start of the lesson. And I'd think a lot about the exciting activity at the end of the lesson, um, which would get students producing the grammar more freely. But too often, I'd see the grammar practice as a part of the lesson to move through quick, as quickly as possible. And um, Next, I'll talk through some practical examples of grammar activities that I think would be exciting and engaging for students. As part of this, I'll talk through a sequence of activities that could be used to practice the form, is it a pencil, and the short answers, yes it is, no it isn't. I'll also talk about how to um, optimize this material to make it work best for students. Finally, after talking through these practical examples, I'm going to try and um, analyze these examples to build up a framework for the practice stage of a lesson that I hope you'll be able to apply to the teaching of other grammar forms. 
Okay, before we start the main part of the presentation though, I'm interested to hear from you all about how you go about teaching grammar. So as a quick survey, I'd like you to take a look at the quotes on your screen now and choose the option that best describes your approach to grammar teaching. I'll give you a minute now to read through the options and then to vote in the poll which should be appearing in a couple of seconds. Um, if you don't think that any of the options really describe how you teach uh, or what you do in class, then feel free to put something else into the chat box. Okay, I see that most people have voted now, so I'll get started again. Um, I can see that um, I can see that most people have picked uh, option number two, what I'll call a presentation practice production teaching sequence. That is not too much of a surprise because that's probably the most common way of teaching grammar around the world at the moment. So it's not a surprise that so many of you picked this option. Um, people who pick this option, you're in luck because today's webinar really focuses on this approach to teaching. So it's really all for you. And I hope that today's session gives you some new ideas to enrich your grammar teaching sequences. Um, I see that the second most popular option was option number four. Um, that's a, another popular method. It's often used, for example, in task-based teaching. So where teachers, for example, feed in language to students when they need to complete a task. I think a lot of what I say in today's session um, is also applicable to this approach. So I hope that the today's session gives you some ideas about how to stage the parts of the lesson where you focus on grammar and make these parts of the lesson um, more memorable for students. OK. So I'm going to start my zoom in on practice now. And I want to start this by thinking for a few minutes about what practice is and what exactly we want it to achieve. So let's take a look at some of the main ways that practice is defined. So the first definition is this. Practice is the middle part of a presentation, practice, production, teaching sequence. Let me just explain for a moment what I mean by that. In our story earlier, the lesson started with the teacher presenting new language to students. She demonstrated the meaning of, is it a chair, using her mind. As part of this stage of the lesson, she'd probably also present the form of the grammar to students and maybe check that they could pronounce it too. Next up, the middle part of the teaching sequence, um, this is the first part of the lesson where teachers step to the side and allow students to start using the grammar themselves. In fact, it's probably what most of the time in primary grammar lessons will be spent doing. Then the end of the story that I told you earlier, uh, that was the production stage of the lesson. So this was where students, this was where the student was blindfolded and asked his partner what was in his hands. I think that this stage of the lesson is also distinct from practice because here the focus was on achieving a task and the students were able to use all of the language they knew in order to do this, 
not just the grammar from the lesson. So what do we want grammar, um, what do we want practice to achieve? For this, let's take a look at uh, some definitions from two of my favorite um, books with which have confusingly similar names. They're called Teaching Languages to Young Learners and Teaching Young Language Learners. Um, I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds to let you read these two definitions. But just to make you aware, these authors use slightly different terms for the idea of practice. They use the terms deliberate practice and procedurization. If you could type done into the chat box when you're finished reading, I'll know when to move on. Okay, I can see lots of people have typed done now, so um, I'll, I'll carry on. So what I found interesting about these definitions was that they were actually quite similar. I think that looking at these, I saw that practice has three main objectives. Firstly, there's the part that I've colored in blue on your slides now, which is to remember new grammar or to commit the new language to learners' working memory. Secondly, there's the green parts. So practice allows students to new, use the new grammar quickly. So it's ready for instant and fluent use. Um, it helps them retrieve it quickly and efficiently. The third part, the red parts, that's that Practice allows students to know when to use the grammar they've learned. So, um, yeah, so using it when it's needed um, or choosing and using the form to express meaning. So I've talked about the what, what is practice, and now I'd like to move on to the how, how to make practice work well, or maybe even perfectly for young learners. So I've identified five factors that I think are key for this. Um, and I'm going to go through this from left to right, so from green to purple. So firstly, I think that young learners need a large quantity of practice. A large number of chances to practice the grammar is going to be important to help students remember it and to be able to use it automatically. I think this is also going to help keep the pace of the lesson quick, which should keep students motivated and help with classroom management. You know, bored students are going to be less able to sit still, talk quietly, remain in their seats and so on. So having lots of different practice activities or lots of different stages in the practice activities is going to be useful. Um, if we're going to give students a large quantity of practice, we're going to need to set it up in different ways to keep students motivated. So I've called this mixing heads up and heads down activities. Um, by heads up activities, I mean activities where students are uh, speaking, working in pairs, doing game-like activities, moving around the classroom, and so on. By heads down activities, I mean the activities where students are writing or looking at their books. And I think that by mixing, mixing these two types of activities can keep students uh, engaged and stop them losing concentration. So the third thing is the achievability of tasks. We want students to be getting the correct answer on, on tasks. And this is because we want students to start to use the new language automatically. And we want them to be automating 
the correct answer most of the time. Um, as an aside, this getting the correct answer most of the time is also going to be important to keep young learners motivated, help them keep believing that English is something achievable for them. Um, the next thing is when to use forms. I remember when I was teaching in Vietnam, I asked a student at one point what he did last weekend, and he replied, last weekend I'm going to the National Museum. So I, I tried to correct him, I pointed behind me and said, last weekend, he said, last weekend I go to the National Museum. I shrugged again, last weekend I have gone to the National Museum. What I thought was interesting about this was that he'd mastered the form of lots of different kinds of grammar. In, in a way, he was able to say future, future simple, present simple, present perfect correctly, but he didn't know when to use them. He hadn't understood their meanings. So to help students remember the meaning of forms and when to use them, I think it's important that as many activities as possible require students to understand the meaning of the grammar. Um, and I'll, we'll look at some examples of this in a couple of minutes. Finally, I think that tasks should allow differentiation in the classroom. By this, I mean that they should allow stronger students to do something more challenging and weaker students to do something easier. Um, in your context, you might also need to make some accommodations for students with special needs. An easy way of differentiating is to set open activities for students. So, for example, you could ask students to think of as many examples they can to put into the sentence, is it a? Weaker students will come up with examples from the lesson. So, is it a pencil? Is it a pen? Stronger students will come up with um, more complex stuff. Is it my favorite radio control car? Um, is it a pink and green monster? Um, and so on. Okay, so next up, I'm going to run through a series of example activities and talk about the way that these apply, some of the, the five principles um, that are on the slide now. All of the example activities that I look at are going to be focused on teaching the form, is it a? And together, they'll make up the middle of the part of the story that I used to, to start this session. The first activity that I'd use is one of my favorite drilling activities. I like this because, you know, sometimes drilling activities can be a bit dull. But this one doubles up as a kind of a, a memory game. So the way it works is this. First, I draw up a table on the board and fill it with blank lines. Then I start to um, elicit, elicit the language, the grammar from the lesson from students. And this slowly fit, starts to fill up the lines um, until eventually the table is completely full. Um, once the table's full, I point to the words and ask students to repeat after me. So, is it a pencil case? I point to the words, is it a pencil case? And students would repeat, is it a pencil case? And so on. Then, after I've done this a few times, I start replacing, um, replacing the words with blank, blank lines again. But I still point to the blank lines and ask students to repeat those words. That way, students kind of start to re remember what's on the table. Um, after a few minutes of just pointing to these words and erasing more and more of them, the table will be almost completely blank. When I get to this point, I'd ask students to work in pairs and try and write out the table from memory. I put pairs of stronger and weaker students together to help each other. I'd allow for some differentiation in the activity by asking the students who finished first to come and complete the table on the board. This would give st all students a chance to check their answers. 
Let's think back to the five principles for a moment. I think this activity gives students a large quantity of chances to say the sentences at this stage of the class. I'll do this activity quite quickly too, so that the mechanical drilling aspect of it doesn't start to get boring. Maybe I'll try and go through all stages in about 10 minutes. Also, you'll notice that the activity isn't very meaning focused. I think that that's okay at this stage in the lesson because the grammar has been recently introduced to students. But this does mean that we'll need to focus on the meaning of the grammar later in the lesson. Um, one other example of an activity you might use at this stage of the lesson when teaching a different grammar form would be to use this, this activity from a textbook. So you, you could listen, um, yeah, ask students to repeat the sentences um, after you from the book. Then you could ask students to fill in the gaps using the word in the box. So I'd like to hear some of your ideas now. Um, so what are some activities you'd suggest for this stage in a lesson? In particular, activities that help students practice saying, uh, pronouncing and spelling new grammar. So if you could type those into the chat box now. Nice. So there's some really nice um, examples coming up um, coming up in the chat box now. Uh, I really like the example of uh, jazz chants, for example, that they're really nice kind of fun drilling activity. Um, there's a suggestion uh, about doing pair work, question and answers. Um, I, a, a pair work activity I really like at this stage in the lesson is um, yeah, get, just getting students to drill drill each other with the target grammar from the class. Um, some other examples. Um, yeah, you can let let students be teachers and give instructions to one another. Um, that would, might work really nicely for the um, yeah for for the for the grammar form that's uh, on the slide now. Okay, so next up, I do an activity, another practice activity, which focuses on meaning, but still offers students a lot of support. So I'd suggest doing a reading or listening stage usually at this activity, at this stage in the lesson. So here's a task in the textbook that I'd like to use at this point. That's the task that you can see on your slide now. In this task, students look at the pictures and decide whether the correct response to each question is yes it is or no it isn't. Um, so for example, number two, the question reads, is it a pencil? And the picture for number two shows a pencil. Number three, the question reads, is it a desk? Um, but the picture shows a bag. So the answer would be no it isn't. But in my lesson, students have just done a heads down activity. Um, they've just written, written out the grammar table. So I'd want to adapt this activity from the table to get students moving around. What I'd do to achieve this is I'd photocopy the pictures and the sentences. Then I'd give half the students a card with one of the pictures on 
and half a card with a question written on. Then I'd ask students to walk around the classroom freely, speaking to other students to find a person who has a question that matches their picture. I'd encourage students who have pictures on their cards to use the phrases, yes it is, and no it isn't. I'd also explain that they aren't allowed to look at each other's cards. I'd repeat this activity a few times by collecting cards from students and then giving them out again. After this, as extra reinforcement of what they've practiced, I'd ask students to complete the written version of the activity from the textbook, the activity that we saw on the previous side, slide. Um, a nice technique that I like to use with my students um, when they've got a, a, a slip of paper with some text on it, for example, is to read from the cards like an actor. Um, the way that actors often learn their lines is to read them from a script, then look up their script and act out the line. You can, student, you can ask students to do the same thing here. They look at their cards to read the phrase, then look up and act it out and say it to whoever they're speaking to. So reflecting on this activity for a moment and thinking back to the five principles from earlier on. I think the stages are quick enough uh, in this activity to keep students engaged. There's a speaking stage and a writing stage that work together to provide a nice balance of heads up and heads down activities. By repeating the spoken stage, the activities give students a large quantity of opportunities to practice the lesson's grammar too. And you'll notice a few things about this grammar. Firstly, I think this activity generates a meaningful context in which the grammar is used. Because students aren't allowed to look at each other's cards, there's an information gap between them. In other words, they don't have the same information as each other, and so there's a need and a reason for them to communicate. This makes what, the, what I've been calling um, the activity meaning-focused. You'll also notice that the language students need to say is really quite easy. Either they're reading a sentence or they're just responding um, with yes it is or no it isn't. So because of this, I think the activity you know, it really uses students' receptive skills, but it still involves speaking and movement. One other example of an activity you might use um, at this stage of the lesson is this. So this activity, again, it's a kind of receptive practice activity. Um, so here students match sentences with the pictures. So you can see sentence number two, pass me a ruler, please, uh, and they'd match that with C. So next up in the lesson sequence, I do a freer practice activity that requires students to produce language from memory. And hopefully it allows students to start using the grammar more automatically. The first activity that I do with students at this stage would be a game-like activity where students guess what's on a flashcard that they can't see. So I'd explain this activity to students by modeling it. I'd take some flashcards and hold them so that uh, I could see the picture on the flashcard, but the, others, but the students couldn't. Then students would ask me what I have on my flashcard. They'd say, is it a pen? Is it a crayon? Is it a bag? I'd reply, no it isn't, no it isn't, no it isn't, and so on, until they guessed the picture correctly. Then. I'd hand out mini flashcards to students. They'd take it in turns to do the activity themselves in small groups. I'd repeat the activity a few times with different students holding the flashcards and maybe in different groups too. Um, then 
I might also want students to do a written activity, which also gets them producing and writing the language more freely. I might set this for homework, but I'll prob it will probably be a reordering activity, something like the one that's appeared on your slide now. So you'll notice a few things about these activities. Firstly, they involve the production of language forms. But these activities only use the grammar from the lesson, and not the rest of students' language resources. Also, the objective of each activity is to display knowledge of the grammar that they've used in the class. So I think that I'd call these practice activities rather than production activities. Thinking back to the principles again, I think that students will find the game-like elements of the flashcard activity really fun and motivating. Also, because students only know a small amount of language at this point, I think they'd finish the activity quite quickly. I think maybe they'd enjoy completing it around twice each, but this still means that they'd probably finish within about 10 minutes. Here, again, students have a large quantity of chances to use the lesson's language by, because of the repetition in the task. If you wanted to repeat the task one more time, you could ask students to see how many times they could complete the activity, how many times they could guess what's on the flashcard in three minutes. You'll notice, it, you'll notice also that the flashcard activity creates another information gap. Um, the student who's holding the flashcard knows what the picture shows, but the guessing students don't. And I think, again, this information gap gives students a meaningful context to use the language and a real reason to use it. To allow differentiation in this activity, I think that I'll tell students that they could have their books open but face down while they're doing the activity. I'd I'd allow them to look at their books if they needed to, just for a few seconds. But, and this would allow weaker students to get any additional help or prompts that they needed. Stronger students should, also, should be able to complete the activity without this additional help, though. Um, just to give one further example of an activity you could use at this stage of the lesson, um, here's an activity I like. It's called the Please Game. So this game works a lot like the traditional uh, game Simon Says. Um, if a student says, sit down at your desk, please, the other student says it, does it. But if the student doesn't say please, so they just say, sit down at your desk, the student doesn't do it. OK, so I'd like to take a moment now again to hear some of your suggestions for practice tasks that we could use at this stage of the lesson. These are practice activities that get students speaking. So yeah, could you uh, type your, any suggestions you have into the chat box now please?
Great. Um, I can see lots of really, really cool ideas uh, in the chat box now. Um, so ju just to draw um, your attention to some of the ones that I've spotted, um, there's the um, the activity suggested uh, where students close their eyes um, and um, yeah, yeah. So maybe they have. So, sorry, I'm I'm butchering the explanation. So there's the what's what's missing activity suggested. Um, there's a, a load of objects in front of students. Um, students close their eyes, and then one of the words is taken away. It's a nice idea of um, singing activities, call and response, um, total physical response activities are suggested too. Um, role plays. Um, drawing of items on the board while students are guessing. It's lots of lovely ideas there. Thanks for sharing. Um, I have a few concluding remarks about the activity sequence that I've suggested. So I'd like to run through the sequence that these activities have fallen into. And I'll also suggest that I think this uh, sequence is a useful framework for the tuition of other grammar forms. Um, in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the order of the activities that I suggested today occurred in. So there were three main stages, I think. So first, there was the drilling activity where students completed the grammar table, first as a class, then from memory. And this was practicing pronunciation and practicing um, spelling and writing. Then there was the receptive practice activity um, where students walked around the classroom to find a classmate who had a picture that matched their questions. Then they did a similar activity in their book. Then third up, students completed an activity with flashcards where they quizzed a classmate about what was on their cards. I think that it's useful to divide grammar practice into these three substages, and it's useful to look at the objectives of these stages separately. So there was the formation practice, which aimed to practice the writing and pronouncing of the grammar. Then next up, there was the receptive practice, where students which practiced uh, reading, hearing, understanding the grammar. And then there was the productive practice, uh, which aimed to help students practice speaking or writing using the grammar more freely. If we move from left to right in this sequence, the activities move from being more teacher controlled to more student controlled, more mechanical and drill like to freer and more game-like. Of course, this sequence on its own isn't everything everything students would need. Um, like we heard in the story at the start of the session, the lesson would need to start with the teaching of new language, and the lessons will probably end with a production activity. Also, because the an objective of the practice sequence is to make language memorable, Frequent review of the material is going to be necessary to prevent students forgetting it all and to have them produce long term memories. Ideally, probably we'd review the language at various points, for example, once after a few days, once after a week, and maybe once a month later. However, I hope that the sequence provides you with a useful framework for teaching grammar to young learners. I also hope that it helps you think about the substages that students go through when practicing grammar. Finally, I hope the presentation has given you some new ideas for activities to try out with your students. Um, I know that we've only had a short amount of time together today, but I'd love to carry on drawing on your experience as teachers and give you a chance to exchange more of your favorite grammar practice activities. So for the next week, um, 
please tweet your favorite uh, activity using the hashtag supergrammar um, and uh, yeah m myself um, at Colin underscore sage and at Cambridge UPELT will retweet our favorite activities um, so to get this started I just just wanted to share two more of my favorite practice activities um, so the first one of these is a paper chain activity um, so for this activity I, I cut out usually the uh, the paper chains of these little people in advance of the class then I ask students to go around and interview each other um, this paper chain was used for practicing what's your favorite color uh, you can see people have written on um, purple orange as their favorite colors um, another activity I really like is the helping hand activity um, so in this activity students draw around their hands and write five of the ways that they help at home um, one on each of the finger so at home I help by walking the dog tidying my room doing the washing up dusting the TV and so on um, and I really like this activity because students really enjoy reading about um, yeah, reading the ways which uh, other students help at home um, and perhaps they they even get new ideas of, of ways to help and become more more diligent sons and daughters okay so just to say thank you thank you for listening um, and we're going to open up the session to a question and answer now um, Many thanks, Colin, for such an interesting session. Now, um, if anyone has any questions uh, for our great speaker today, please type in the chat box.